This is the Your Career Story Podcast, and you're listening to episode 75, How to Figure Out Your Calling with Steph J. Welcome to Your Career Story Podcast, a show that's designed for rock star professionals looking for that extra booster shot of confidence in their careers. Whether you're trying to get clarity on a job transition, want some work-life balance inspiration, or need a strategy to snag that promotion or raise, this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Jenna Viviano, ex-Wall Streeter turned startup junkie who now coaches hundreds of clients, empowering them to take back control of the job search and land their dream job. So sit back, grab a glass of wine, and prepare yourself for your weekly boost of career confidence. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Your Career Story podcast. I am with my dear friend, Steph J here today, where we are going to be talking all about faith at work. So a lot of you, before I kind of let her chime in and tell you a little bit about herself and her philosophy around faith at work, you guys know that I am a woman of faith. This is no surprise to you that we might be talking about this eventually, Um, but we've never done a full episode on how I think about faith at work, and we've never really had a guest come and talk about it. So while I'm on my sabbatical, I really wanted to have somebody speaking into this area that I think is really, really important that we, especially if you are a person of faith, if you're a Christian, don't talk about it enough. There are not enough sermons about it. We talk about marriage and relationships more than we ever talk about somewhere where we spend 90,000 hours of our entire lives at. So um, I'm really, really excited. But Steph is a dear friend of mine um, that when we recorded this the first time, we realized that I actually remember her very first day of being on campus at Lehigh University, which is how we met. And we've stayed kind of friends all these years. So Steph, thank you so much for joining us and dealing with all of our tech issues today. (laughs) No problem. Thanks so much for having me. It really is such an honor. I look up to you in more ways than one. And so uh, it really is such a privilege to get to be with you today. So thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Well, why don't you, you've had such an interesting career story and some of the things that you've done in your lifetime. And so um, why don't you just kind of give us a little bit of a synopsis going back to Lehigh, because we did go to school together. If you could kind of just start there and share, like, what did you study in school and take us all the way kind of through briefly into what you're doing now and how faith has had a, a part in that. Awesome. Well, so I am a South Florida girl and I moved, packed all my stuff up and moved all the way to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. (laughs) Which is Um, nowhere and cold. (laughs) Literally so cold and so gloomy and not what you would think a sunshine girl would be looking for. But um, I definitely got a lot out of my Lehigh experience, um, including incredible lifelong friends. But I studied Africana studies and psychology while I was there. And two very you would think like completely opposite sides of the spectrum. I think that one, it does involve like sociology and all that kind of stuff. And the other is really super scientific. But like, I think with Africana studies, there's a heart component that is different than some of these other um, things that came out of my psychology studies. But at, during my time studying, I wasn't just in the books all the time between being in a sorority and uh, leading Bible studies and going to Bible studies before I got to lead them like the one that you led for people in fraternities and sororities. Which is uh, so funny because I don't know. I said this before, but I do not know who allowed me to do that because I've told this, I've told the story how I met Jesus on Wall Street. Yeah. And I was doing the things in mm-hmm. college that people, anybody who went to college with me would say that, oh yeah, that's the Christian girl. But I like didn't have, I had the head knowledge, but I didn't yeah. have the heart knowledge. I had the desire, but I don't think I was really walking with the Lord. I didn't feel like I was, didn't know who, a, what a personal relationship with Jesus really looked like until I started working on Wall Street. And that's when my life really changed. I don't know. Was that yeah. similar for you too? Yeah. So I started to have some of that relational revelation in like my junior year of college where I was like, wait, I've got a calling on my life to whether it's minister the gospel to young people or whatever. Like I just felt like a tug that was like, Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm actually supposed to live a little differently, but it still didn't, it didn't move from head to heart at that time. And it took actually several years of, you know, adulting to Mm -hmm. actually get to a place where I like was in desperate need of God. Mm -hmm. And it was in my like kind of desperation or in like that broken place that like he met me. And then it was like, oh, 
yeah, no, I never want to live without this person. Like, Mm -hmm. like falling in love, even though, you know, I haven't gotten to do that yet, (laughs) but it's like, it was like that, you know, like, like it was literally like, oh my gosh, the one I found the one, but that was really just such a, it was a journey. It wasn't this like one moment, but it was over time. That's good. So you graduated from college with a double major basically, right? Um, so awesome. I love it. I also did the same. (laughs) My, my fiance jokes. He's like, of course you got a double major. Like, of course you were that girl. (laughs) uh, Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Um, okay. So what happens next after college then, then what happens? So, um, I moved back home, which in the semi Ivy, if that's what you want to call it. I called it the under Ivy. I Brent I laughs at that. me. He's like, he's like under Ivy. That's not a real thing. I said, I just made it one. So just go with it. <laughs> I'm going to a hundred percent take that. So the under Ivy, it yeah. is not a thing to move back home, but, um, I moved back home with a desire to kind of plug into a church and figure out what this calling or this tug was. Um, and anybody who knew me at that time would tell you that I told them that I didn't need to work because God would provide, which is true a hundred percent. Yeah. But I had this idea in my mind, like you could tell I had no idea what I was really being called to because I was sure. like, oh, yeah, like I'll just, you know, sit right here. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll come <laughs> everything period, you know? So I think and- that's, people think that sometimes though too, where like, I'm a firm believer too, that God will provide. That's a huge part mm-hmm. of how I run my business, right? We yes. always have to, and Brent, he is commission-based in his business. So it's like very much so have to rely on the Lord, but you got to do something too. <laughs> yes, exactly. He's not like sit here and just wait, no, get your hands and your feet and your knowledge yes. and use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of, the first couple of months at home and I, I joined the church internship, which was amazing. And I quickly learned that it wasn't going to be sitting around and doing nothing and just everything kind of coming to fruition. It was, no, it was going to take hard work. It was going to take an extreme amount of meekness and humility. And then I was going to have to listen for next steps, like listen for calling. And so the next step I got was to work as a high school, like, counselor, like pre-college counselor. So I helped kids pick what school they were going to go to for a year, which was cool, cool, but also stressful because all I wanted to do was tell them to go to Lehigh. (laughs) Which is like the opposite for me. I think you know this. Like I would have, I didn't let my sister apply there. I was like, do not apply to that school. (laughs) (laughs) I was just like, it's a good school. You know, you'll get a lot of knowledge. There's other bad things, but don't worry about that. Um, But (laughs) But I I had to learn to actually look. It was really interesting how God used this, but I had to look at their needs and their skills and their gifts and like their test scores and all of those things that individualize them Mm -hmm. and help them to make a decision that was right for them rather than imposing my preference or idea of greatness upon them. Mm -hmm. And I think that like hindsight 2020, that was a lesson God was teaching me for where I'm at right now. So okay. in between working with, uh, at a Christian school, college counseling, I worked for five years at a private school running um, auxiliary programming. So what pretty much that? anything that grosses money for um, an educational institution, that's not, you know, the tuition. So that's okay. private dance lessons, piano, after school enrichment, summer camp. So like anything that was revenue based within a, a private school. That's cool. Okay. I didn't realize that that's what that meant. So that's really neat. Okay. So you did that for five years. Yes. So I did that for a little under five years. And so I was the auxiliary programs director at a private school. And uh, that was really interesting because it was not a Christian based organization. It was really like multi-faith or Mm -hmm. something kind of like that. And, and with a strong, heavy emphasis on like Jewish holidays and things like that. And so Mm -hmm. I learned a lot actually about Um, the significance of some Jewish holidays, some different things like that from like little kindergartners who would be like, Miss Stephanie, let me tell you about X, Y, and Z. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really actually awesome that you know that. But that encouraged me throughout the process because these little kids who had this heritage and this faith attached to them, though it was different than my faith, they were proud enough and knowledgeable enough about their faith Mm -hmm. to share it with me. Mm -hmm. And so that was like this moment of like, okay, all right, another nod from God. Like 
what does that look like for me to to take my faith and to own it like these little kindergartners do? Um, yeah. You know, um, that was actually a really beautiful revelation I had, like after being out of that now in my new career. <laughs> which is which is where? <laughs> uh, so right now I serve as the next generations director um, at a church here in South Florida. And it is challenging and rewarding all at once. It is interesting to see how every single part of my story has been orchestrated to equip me for this very moment. And so that's kind of where I am right now vocationally. I am mm-hmm. a vocational minister, so to speak. And then um, on the side, my little dreams, I used to compete in pageants. Which I love that part of your story because it's, it's so... Fun. I mean, you were doing that when we were in college. Were, were yes. you not? Yes. You were doing that while we were in college. And I, I vividly remember thinking, she's so cool. I just, <laughs> I was like, oh, she's so cool that she's doing these things because, you know, as little girls, it's probably something I imagined. And my, my mother was, it was not a popular thing in the North, just yeah. kind of where we grew up. It wasn't just really a very typical thing, but you've kind of mentioned how very much that was, that was kind of like a job interview when you were, you were like getting mm-hmm. used to interviewing, which people probably don't think they probably have misconceived notions about what pageants look like. And that's fine. We, you know, we see toddlers and tiara. We think that's what your life is <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> when it, that definitely was not <laughs> definitely not. Right. And so tell us a little bit about kind of how that played even into, we're talking about calling, we're talking about purpose. We're talking about you know, faith, talk to us a little bit about the pageant life and kind of how that was your passion project outside of your actual nine to five position. So, um, I've actually competed since I was 15 years old. I no longer compete because I've aged out, but promise I will be back in a Mrs. Pageant one day. Yes, girl. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Um, Why do you love them so much? I'd love to hear that. So honestly, I have found like the time and the investment of discovering who it is that I am so incredibly rewarding. Mm. So for me, pageants were not about glitzy dresses. It was, I was a part of a pageant coaching team. I had a a team behind me that really valued self-discovery and becoming who it is that you really are meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was this like, not that I was an ugly duckling or really that anyone should ever be referred to as that, but it was like this, this person over here who began the journey. Mm. And then the person who I am now are the same individual, but flourishing in a way that was always inside of me to begin with. And I think that that's what I love about pageants is that it helped me to discover that there was something inside of me that could flourish in this setting that didn't make me less than someone else if I didn't win, but instead, like it was like rock star girl next to rock star girl mm. chasing the same dream and the same goal and and winning in their own right, like not based upon a title or receiving anything, but really walking in this identity of being crowned from the very beginning. And so that's kind of where my love really rose up for pageants. And so now I'm on that pageant coaching team, coaching so fun. girls, which is the best job ever as the <laughs> director of joy and encouragement is literally my <laughs> title. <laughs> I love that. So it, that all incorporates into, I know that you had said we had been talking prior to this, but just how your faith has been incorporated into that. So, mm-hmm. I mean, no, it wasn't necessarily a job. It, I mean, the time effort that took in that you put into it, you might as well say that it was a job, yeah. right? So talk to us a little bit about how faith is incorporated into that and how you think about faith. It could, because you've had both, on, obviously, these hobbies, mm-hmm. um, which are more than a hobby. It's like really like a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and then also being in an environment that was a Christian school, but you weren't working, quote unquote, in ministry. Then you were working in a non-Christian school, obviously not ministry, and then working in ministry. So like, I think you have such a cool vantage point to talk about this because so many people, I believe Christians will think that the only way to live out your faith at work is if you are in ministry. And I feel like you have such a good perspective to show that that's just not true. Yeah. So when I first heard like that phrase like faith at work, what happened to me in my mind, because I I love words, is I realized it's really like honestly a double entendre. Mm. Like faith at work is what you do, but if your faith's not at work, like it won't work. And so you have to 
actually activate your faith. And so what I realized in every season was that as my faith grew, it grew far more simple and actually natural to allow my faith to bleed into my work. So if we kind of went uh, to each of those stopping points, so working at a Christian school, it was very much um, like a case of holding up a mirror and saying, hey, what what do I look like right now as an adult who have actually attended that school, which is so fascinating. So that was where I graduated from high school. So how do I, as an adult who is walking out my faith, how do I represent Jesus to these kids? How do we have um, moments where they might be discouraged? What is discouraging them? Like, what did I face at this age that I needed faith to encourage me? So when the ACT score wasn't just right, and when that boy broke up with you, and when the kids in the hallway were talking whatever they were talking, or you didn't get invited Mm -hmm. to that party or whatever, like the things that got you down, like how was I as an adult helping them to realize that they had somewhere to go when they were down? That's good. That was like my, that was like the, the crux for me in that position. Mm -hmm. Then in this new position at, as an auxiliary programs director, where I couldn't freely discuss like my faith. Sure. And so I had to express this great love I had for Jesus without saying his name or even uttering really the facts about it. I had to let it. Which got to be really hard. Cause I know, especially in a school, you have to be really careful. Well, yes. we're like, if I, I talked about Jesus on wall street when I like became a <laughs> believer, I was like, so <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, I love that. Um, but I would imagine that you obviously you have to be very respectful of people's, you know, belief structures and the parents and all that kind of stuff. So you were talking really about, about showing them yes. who Jesus was. So how did you, how did that look? So um, I have a really awesome example that I remember so vividly. So there was one day I was uh, charged with like teaching this class and it was essentially like um, a class on like efficacy and like, how do you matter? Like, how do you do something that matters with your life? Mm. And so I would go in and have these really deep conversations with middle schoolers that were like really bizarre. Like I would play songs for them and, and I would, I would ask them, okay, like, draw me a circle and in the circle, put everything that you think a person who matters would be like all the characteristics of a person who matters. Now make a list of all the characteristics you have. Okay. Now circle where those things match and Mm. figure out, wait, does that make my clients do that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And now, so when you look at this paper and you circled the things they do and they matter and you've circled the things that you have, what does that mean about you? Mm. Oh, it means that you matter. It means that the things that you do in your life make a difference. And so like, here I am having these conversations, speaking life into them. And I didn't get this life from my own knowledge. No, the Lord actually spoke that life into me. Mm -hmm. So I was able to then speak that life into them. It's an outpour and overflow of what I had already received. And so what I realized in my time working at this school was that the most important part of me sharing my faith at this non-Christian school or in this organization was that my faith had to actually exist, that Mm -hmm. I couldn't just talk about being a Christian, that I had to have a real relationship with God, that I needed to be in my Bible, that I needed to spend time around other believers, that I needed to um, challenge the questions I had in my faith, like ask those difficult questions, Mm -hmm. you know, And then I had to just walk differently. There was a particular kind of joy that I chose to bring to work. Like everyone puts their clothes on to go to work. Mm -hmm. Unless you're working from home, you wear leggings on the bottom and a cute top. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, other than that, everyone puts on certain things to go to work. And I knew I needed to put on joy and I needed to put on gentleness and I needed to put on self-control. And so I, I took it upon myself to even like speak the, the fruits of the spirit over myself. I, Mm -hmm. I had a motto that I would literally recite like in my mirror to myself as I would get ready for work. Like I took it very seriously that I was going to need to dress myself in faith in order to go out into this place that was not a, necessarily a church because mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to stay as much as I would be able to do. 
And so that's good. And I think that's what, for people that are listening that are believers and really want to figure out how do I, because I think we fall into two camps, right? We either Mm -hmm. go on one end of the spectrum where we don't say anything at all. We don't do anything at all. We just like operate. Mm -hmm. And then the other end of the spectrum is we like, we think that Christianity at work means like bringing a Bible and placing it on everybody's like, (laughs) yeah, like Bible beating. (laughs) We're filming this and we're like doing the motions (laughs) y'all. And so I feel like we think it's one of those two things where at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, it's really not. It's really somewhere in the middle where it's more of the, what you were talking about, it's like faith in action. That's what it is. Yeah. It's faith in action. It's, it, it's even, I think about with coworkers too. So mm-hmm. you obviously were talking about students, but I'm yeah. even thinking about from a coworker perspective, right? Yeah. How do you show up for your coworkers? I remember there were times when I worked at the Muse and, um, there were, I was a sales trainer and I would have conversations with people that were, you know, failing at, they weren't performing. Let's just say that they weren't performing. So Mm -hmm. having conversations around that. And then I was talking about my faith. I was like, I don't know how you work through these, but I know you're struggling right now. Here's how I think about it. Here's what's helped me in the past. Here's an instance when I, and just sharing my story. It's not about positioning somebody or propositioning somebody or being like, you must be a Christian. Like that's not what it looks like. It's a lot of that in action, in person, really doing faith doing love as Bob yeah. Goff says, <laughs> but yeah. it's like actually that. that actually doing that work. So how would you say that it maybe looks different or the same mm-hmm. in your role where you actually are physically in a ministry type role? Yeah. Well, so, um, you brought up like the coworker things, if I could just like chime totally, in that for please. like a second. Yeah. So one of the cool things about my old job was just that I would somehow get into these conversations with my coworkers Mm -hmm. and they would wonder like, Hey, what are you going to do when you get off work today? Or like whatever. And I would just tell them if I was going to an event at church, if I was going to do these things or whatever. And so it became known that that's like, that's who I was. And so when stuff really would go down in people's lives, not a joke, they would just come on over to my office Mm -hmm. and they'd be like, Hey, I'd be like, Hey, what's up? Um, and I'm like, um, what? (laughs) Um, so I got this call and then I heard about this, uh, thing that's going on with my dad. And I was just wondering, like, I know I don't do this. I don't do this, but I know you do that praying thing. Could you do that for me and my family? And it would just be this moment where we would just pray together. Mm -hmm. And it would be so awesome because I, I would be like, wait, okay. So this is why you put it on every day. Mm -hmm. So that one moment you can encourage someone who's going through it. They know where to go Mm -hmm. when pain strikes. And I think that that's that's not the only function, but I think for a world that doesn't know God, Mm -hmm. like that is so important to teach them and to remind them that when there is pain, because it's inevitable, Mm -hmm. like where do they go when pain strikes? So. I think about that even with people right now and that we're filming this and recording this in the midst of COVID and um, Mm -hmm. especially for people in the nine to five market, there's been a lot of jobs that have been laid off, right? Um, And thinking about that and how do I have my... Because at the end of the day, I know that I I know truth and I can lean on that truth, but I know mm-hmm. so many people don't. So how do you minister to that in a way that's showing up for those people and directing them not towards mm-hmm. me, but to other people, but me being the conduit or I'm sorry, not to me, but to the Lord and mm-hmm. me just being the conduit to which that happens. Yeah. And so that's something I think about a lot and I thought a lot about in the past six months or so, even probably more so than I've ever have yeah. because of what we're seeing going on in the economy and what we're seeing going on in the world and just like everything. Yeah. It's like, we need, we need Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we need Jesus. Oh, we do. No, for sure. Well, I think, um, I think that it really is, it doesn't have to be super complicated. I think for those who do you have a desire to like do what you're saying to be that conduit? Like you don't have to be like, do not whip out all your scriptures and all your Bible verses and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Just like you said, Jenna, like, Hey, this is what has worked for me. And it's built, building relationships. Exactly. Cause before I can throw my verses at you, which I literally work in vocational ministry. So like, this is kind of like a no, no that I'm saying this, yeah. but like, <laughs> you know, before I do that, let me, let me, love you. Let me be with you, you know? And, and I think that that's so, that's a lost art sometimes, uh, as believers, we can miss it. We can, 
we can try to tell before we stop and we just are with people or we just say, I'm going to love you right where you're at. So, and you do that really, really well. Like I just know that from, from being friends with you, you do that really well of just meeting people where they're at and listening and, and sitting in, in the, whatever it is. I know that you've been that way for me, especially in my single years, we would always talk about that. Right. And just, you were always so good at that. Um, and so anyways, I just Thank want you. people to know that about you. <laughs> so sweet. Thank you so much. But you did ask, um, how it's different in vocational yeah. ministry. And so I think the primary difference is that now as I work in vocational ministry, particularly because I'm overseeing the next generation, mm-hmm. um, I think that I have a deeper understanding of the function and the necessity of the church as a structure and as as the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. I understand that like Christians are not a like are not standalone items, but rather like it's a whole crayon box. Like how upset would you be if you paid money for crayons and there was one crayon in the box? They mm-hmm. wouldn't be useful to you. Mm-hmm. But like you buy a 24 pack of crayons because there's a bunch of crayons in there that are all different colors. Mm -hmm. And that's what helps you draw the most beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I realize in vocational ministry is that like the body of Christ is essential with Mm -hmm. all of its functions. Like you can sing, I can dance, you can preach, I can type, you can file papers, you can uh, serve the homeless. Like every single one of us serves a unique function Um, within the body of Christ and really within this ecosystem of humanity. And the world needs Jesus, like you said. And and if he lives inside of me, that means that when I touch that thing or when I do my job or when I call that person, pray with that person or just show up on time to work. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people think that putting faith at work is about preaching or um, talking about Jesus, like, no girl, be on time to your job. (laughs) Dress appropriately. Talk with kindness and gentleness. Uh, Don't gossip. Don't be the ringleader of that. Like it's so it's, we overcomplicate something that's so Mm -hmm. simple. Like if I want faith to be active at work, I just need to look at my actual Bible see what its instructions are Mm -hmm. and heed those instructions and Mm -hmm. lean into those instructions and then allow them to guide me and know that it's okay if I fail. Like I love uh, David's story. That's always my favorite person to point to because it's like Mm -hmm. he was remarked as a man after God's own heart and he made a huge mess of his life. Yeah. And so God's not- He did. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, he's not looking at me like, hey girl, like you're a mess. Like I'm not going to use you. No, he's like, bring me your mess. Bring me a repentant heart. Be sorry and turn. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like people think repentance is this big, huge thing. And it's like, no, say, hey, I'm sorry. Like mea culpa, that's my time. Mea culpa, mea culpa. (laughs) I love that. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Yes, that's it. I'm sorry and turn. And I think that if we can say I'm sorry and turn, and then we can look in God's word for instruction And then we just try to heed it as best as we can. And Mm -hmm. we just love people and we're gracious and we're merciful and we're kind and we don't return an eye for an eye and we don't Mm. gossip. And and then we do everything as if unto the Lord. I think that that is a um, one thing that people can forget. They can think that they're doing something for man, whether you work at a church or not. You Mm -hmm. can think that you're working this nine to five for somebody. No, like you have that job and you work that job unto God. Wow. So it's like a word. Show up. And you type that email unto God, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. that's it. Like, so that means like at the end, if the signature is typically like a little aggressive, go ahead and drop a sincerely in there. That's a change, it's a shift. Do you understand? Like, I think that that's what I realized is it's not some big grandstand. It's small, continuous steps in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And then faith comes alive more in me. And then because it's supernatural and it's not something I control, it starts to come alive in other people too. Yeah, that's good. What you said just there about, even if you're working for quote unquote, the man, you're not really working for the man, you're working into the Lord. And I think so many of us, and I even forget that. I think I'm working for myself. (laughs) I'm not working for my, I need to be continually reminded that 
I am not working for myself. I'm not working. I'm working for the Lord. So that's so good. Um, One other controversial thing. (laughs) When I say controversial, I mean that Christians overcomplicate this subject matter. And um, I want to ask you this question before we kind of wrap up for today. But, you know, there's this big misconception around calling. And like, where do you think the Christian population gets? Because there's so many people like, well, John, I just don't know my calling. I don't want my calling. And like, maybe it's not as complicated as we think that it is. So Mm -hmm. what do you think about that? So I have actually gotten to share with some of the high schoolers about this because that's a really, I feel like in high school, like junior, senior year, you're like between trying to decide what college you're going to go to. You're also like, who even am I? What am I going to be? Blah, blah, blah. And you're stuck. You're definitely not going to figure it out anytime before you turn 25. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But probably not. Like who actually, I mean, everybody that I work with and most people I interact with on LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. they don't know what they want and they went to school for it, right? Like you're not Mm -hmm. necessarily, I mean, you're using your degrees in different ways, but not probably in, maybe not in the way that you thought you were going to, right? (laughs) Certainly not. No, this is, um, the use of my degree in this way is like, uh, wait, what? Like yeah, even it's very with <laughs> yeah, I'm like, even with everything that's been going on with like social unrest and stuff, yeah. I never thought that it would matter that I would have such a mm. sociological understanding and be a part of vocational ministry in order to find the common ground and to marry where the church belongs in this conversation. But oh. God. I love that. That is a, probably another podcast in and of itself to even de- like talk through that because yeah. I thought of you this past past like two weeks or so with knowing that was your background Mm -hmm. and the church's role in what's going on in our world right now with the social unrest and racial reconciliation and all that fun, jazzy stuff. So, I mean, you're right. God knew, God knew it was like, you have no idea how this is going to play out, but he knows. So when we're talking about calling, like, tell us about that. So when I think about calling, the most simple way to understand, like if you're called to something is, does it come naturally to you? Mm -hmm. If you can get on a bike and you can ride it, you're a bike rider. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how do you, how do you have a bikini body? Put on a bikini, you have a body, you have body. a body. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like, I think that people are like, oh, am I called to ministry as believers in Jesus? If you call yourself a believer in Jesus, the Bible tells us to go out into all the world to make disciples. Mm-hmm. The Bible tells us to be fishers of men. So like, are you called to ministry? Yes, we are all called to ministry, vocational yeah. or not. Mm-hmm. Like, that's an answered question. So you can put that off to the side. So yeah. part of your calling is always to do that. Yes. <laughs> um, but then the other part of like what the actual calling is, you know, am I called to be a teacher? Am I called even some people who are single? Am I called to be married or to be a mom or, you know, like those mm-hmm. kind of things. And so I think that the first thing I, I would say is like, does it come naturally to you? try to figure out that part of it. Like, does, do you feel, do you sense that the Holy Spirit is guiding you in that direction? And if you don't feel super close to the Holy Spirit, the best way to get close to the Holy Spirit and to hear his voice, just like it would be for any person you're in relationship with, is the more you hear it, the more you'll hear it. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. If you just spend time trying to seek after like that kind of intimacy with God. Hey God, can you speak to me in this way? I do uh, some journal prompts, like when I'm praying Mm -hmm. and in my devotional and I just say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me today? And Mm -hmm. I put a little colon and then literally anything that I feel like I'm hearing or sensing in my heart, whether it's a picture, I'll draw it. Or if Mm -hmm. it's a word, I'll write it. And sometimes they're arbitrary and they don't seem like they make any kind of sense or like they're interconnected at all. But Mm -hmm. then the more time I'll spend kind of sitting in it and soaking in it, Mm-hmm. I'll be like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. I can see where this is connected. Or maybe three weeks down the road, I'll be like, oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. Like you made me write down pride and that was three weeks ago. And like, here I am in this situation where I'm feeling like, oh man, I'm getting a little prideful mm-hmm. and I yeah. needed to check my pride three weeks ago. Right. But now I'm in this situation, you know? So I think like familiarizing ourselves with the sound and the voice of God in our mm-hmm. life. And what does that mean to us? So if you are into nature, if you love the ocean, like there's things that, particularly strike a chord in your heart. And so know that like God speaks your language, like he Mm -hmm. desires to speak to you in your way. And so take some time as you're seeking calling or answers about next steps in your life to really go to those places or those things that, Mm -hmm. that, that speak to you 
and allow the Lord to use the thing that already connects Mm -hmm. to you to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think that like what I realize first and foremost is that wherever I am, I am and I'm called to it. Mm-hmm. And so he can move me, God can move me somewhere else. But for the time being, like my option is not to gripe and to grumble about the place that I've been placed. My option is to be where I am, be fully engaged and to be a part of it. And to know that like, if I'm here, I must be called to here. Mm-hmm. But if I was there, I would be called to there. Mm-hmm. Like I know that it can be hard with social media and looking at where they are, but right. don't get caught up in where they are. Because they're where they need to be and you're where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And when it's time for you to move from here, you'll be over there. Mm -hmm. But for right now, you'll have to just stay right where you're at and to do the very best you can with what's right in front of you. So I think calling is, it sounds like super mystical, but there's some practical steps to it. And and we can be, we can be where we are. We can invite the Holy Spirit into the conversation Mm -hmm. and we can see what flows naturally to us. And and sometimes things that flow naturally to us, we might be called to in a different season. I think that that's what I've, I have learned full well is that the Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that there's like a time for everything. Mm-hmm. And there is a time that God is going to make everything beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I think that when we look at the gifts and the talents God has given us, because I know he's given everybody many, some people think they're not gifted at all, but I like- know. I'm like, no, like you're gifted. Yeah. You're, you just have to like, what do you consider to be a gift is really right. The question, right? That's so the question. Yep, totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. And so um, like realizing that like, I might be able to sing, but I'm not the worship leader today. Mm-hmm. That's not my job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or like the biggest one I hear is like, okay, like I'm called to preach. Okay. So talk to your friends and encourage them to walk with the Lord. Mm-hmm. preacher yes. you know what preach. I'm saying like, yes. <laughs> yes. like preach preacher you know like and I think that a lot of people can feel that like hey I'm called to this or I'm called to that and it's like you might be called to that but right now there's some refining that needs mm-hmm. to take place in this season to prepare you to receive that gift that is that position or that title or that stage that you're looking for and then there might come a time that you don't actually get to see it the way that you see it but rather mm-hmm. that you would see your gift and your calling activated the way that God sees for it to be activated. So, I mean, I could talk about this all day. Girl, that was just like, I don't even have, any, I'm like, have so many thoughts because I agree with you on so many of those points of, especially the part around seasons. I think mm-hmm. you see that a lot with people where... Um, like I, the worship leader is the funny one because it's, I feel like that's, a, I live in Nashville. So it's the most common one you hear where it's like, well, maybe yeah. that's just not your calling right now in this season. Mm-hmm. And so, or that, you know, your calling quote unquote can change. Like, I yeah. feel like, you know, there's a, there should be probably some steadfast calling. We're all called to minister. Like that's mm-hmm. the calling. We all have that calling. Now, how does that translate in vocationally? Mm-hmm. I think it can change over time. And that's just what you said. Like, it's okay if it changes, um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be something that you have to triangulate and figure out and, and like, <laughs> hypothesize on and then worry that you're <laughs> yeah. going down the wrong road and like be so up in arms about it. Cause I feel like so many people do that, but yeah. to really follow those practical steps that you had even mentioned, um, that the conversation, the, the prayer, the, you know, being in your Bible, making sure that what you're praying and what you're hearing is aligning what scripture saying, you know, all of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, um, t- working together can really help yeah, bring that to life. So I love everything that you have said thus far about faith at work and how you think about it. And you've even given me some things probably that I need to ruminate on in my sabbatical. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Oh, that was a word for me. So I love that. And I'm going to, you like, honestly, I'm going to go back and think about some of this stuff too. And I think that that's like such a gift is that like with faith, because it is, it's a relationship Mm. is that it, it can be constantly evolving and constantly growing mm-hmm. and and being challenged and refined and corrected. And so there's not a perfection, but a progression that's so beautiful about not just faith at work, but really faith at work in our lives as believers. So I love that. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know everyone's going to get a lot of value out of this. There's going to be a lot of re-listening and ruminating back on, and you're probably going to re-listen to yourself and be like, hmm, I don't know if I, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> yeah, probably. So where can people, um, where can people find you? If they want to get in contact with you, if they want to follow along to you, because she's amazing. She's an amazing woman, not just in her career, but just as a friend. And so I would love to connect people with you. Where's the best place they can find you? Um, so I am a big Instagram, uh, junkie. So I actually have two Instagrams. Uh, you can follow me at life with Steph J, um, literally just as it's spelled. And then, um, at you are underscore crowned and, um, one is my personal life. And then the other one is really just this movement of encouraging women to walk in their royal identity. And so if you know any girls who want to be encouraged to walk in the purpose and the calling that God has for them, you are crowned is where you go. I love it. We'll have all of that stuff in the show note. Thank you so much for joining us. And I can't wait to hear what people's responses are. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Love you. (laughs) Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for listening to Your Career Story podcast. I would love, 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 love to get to meet you. And there are a couple of ways that we can connect in between episodes. First and foremost, you know I love my LinkedIn. Second is via Instagram. And third is over on my website. I actually have a special spot just for you full of fun, free resources. So all you have to do is go to www.genaviviano.com backslash resources. Super simple for a bunch of freebies that will help you boost your career. Hope to see you next week.